Hello, I'm a lemon cake, and for the past couple of weeks I've been working on my own multiplayer rebalance mod. This mod is out now, and this video will be going over the main changes. A multiplayer lobby of 20 people, or 25 if we get too many signups, will be held this coming Sunday, or two days from the video release, and I'll be continuing to run my Sunday lobby as I've been for the last four years from that point onwards. The lobby in question will be running the mod, which I'm about to show you. And if that is something that interests you, feel free to stop by this Sunday at 7pm BST, which is 8pm Central European Time or 2pm American Eastern Time, to watch it live on YouTube. If you're also interested in playing, you're welcome to sign up to the Google Doc linked at the top of the description, where you can also find a link to the Discord server, so you can speak to the people in the game, and also a link to the mod itself. But with the preambles out of the way, let's get into the changes of the mod itself. Loading into the mod itself, we can immediately see some changes made to the terrain. For the most part, Europe is similar. Well, there's been some more straight crossings, but we'll get to that in a minute. But we have removed um, the vast majority of Asia for performance issues and the fact that most players that were in Asia just kind of had free games and had no one else to fight. India and Oirat, by extension, are basically optional seeds, and as is vast parts of Africa, in that you can seed players there if you're thinking of running a lobby here yourself, but if you don't have anyone there, it's not that big of a deal. It's a good place to have any of the reseeds from people that die early. But with that out of the way, let's get into the actual game and just start looking around the map. North America has unfortunately lost its Pacific coast. However, the other thing it's lost is all of their rather annoying natives. Those are just gone now, so Native America can be colonized without much impediment. The natives in Mexico still continue to be there for any Portuguese conquering desires, and the natives in South America were never that egregious, so they are allowed to continue their existence, at least until the Europeans arrive. Africa remains unchanged, but in Asia... We see the removal of China, Japan, Korea, and, well, Southeast Asia. This has a quite negative impact for the in Indians in terms of making trade from that area, but by the time you start getting to Persia, India is still going to be the main source of money there, so it should remain relatively unaffected. This also hurts Oirat's early developments and moves into the Ming, but should remain relatively viable as a country still. Ming uh, is actually still present on the map as a Jianmine culture province. This is the observer tag if the observer wants to play in the, uh, in the country of Ming. There's a special game rule that prevents anyone declaring war on the Ming, so even if someone does discover them uh, out here surrounded by Wasteland, they'll be unable to do anything about it. Now, let's start talking about some straight crossings, and there's been a lot added. First of all, England has gained a straight cross between Kent and Calais. Of course, to use a straight crossing, England will need to, well, maintain naval superiority. But more importantly, to keep England safe, its naval superiority, even if Calais is fallen, is still enough to maintain control of the straight crossing, and hence not be an issue for the invasion of England. But if anyone is able to ever overcome English naval superiority, it does become easier to actually land on England proper. England also has a slightly easier time in terms of, well, their Irish possessions, since they're able to immediately walk over there with the straight crossings added between Cumbria, Man and Pale. The straight crossing between the Scottish territory remains. Furthermore, since England tends to grow into the Norwegian islands, and these islands are now just a bit more connected. This straight crossing existed before, but now the Orkney Islands and the, uh, well, the rest of the uh, islands over here are actually connected by straight crossing, allowing England to contest those islands a lot more. Moving into northern Germany now, first of all we see that Lund, Bornholm and Rügen are now straight crossings, allowing for more maneuverability and movements through this area. Furthermore, Gotland has lost their island privileges, now being connected to, into the mainland Swedish territories from Kalmar, and also providing another avenue of air movement into the Livonian order by being connected through this straight crossing here. Now to a rather interesting, albeit probably controversial change, we will see that Soita has not been returned to Morocco, but this straight crossing is different. See, the Gibraltar Straits of Gibraltar straight crossing actually goes between Gibraltar and Tangiers. This gives a rather interesting dynamic for the potential Morocco-Portugal-Castile early wars, where the straight crossing is still held by Morocco at the start, therefore Castile still has a much harder time going into Morocco initially off the bat. However, this can be given a greed play by Morocco, uh, sorry, the Portuguese placing their armies initially on Soita to try and attack that way before the war starts. But this has a secondary issue, if that army is ever defeated, it's retreat point to Soita, which leads to very easy stack wipes to the Moroccans, allowing them that if they do win, they win big. Furthermore, it gives Morocco a large heads up, if you see troops starting to be moved into Soita, you can see the, you know, the, t the times on the wall, allowing you to either declare war on Soita early, if you are prepared to do so, 
And furthermore, you get a very nice war goal to defend against the Portuguese. We'll get to war goals and the changes to those definitions in a bit, but in essence, it gives the Portuguese a double-edged sword, since the Portuguese are probably wanting to hold on to this, but they can also do some diplomacy with Morocco and return it as well day one, if they so wish. The Mediterranean islands are a lot more connected now. Aragon is actually connected to their islands and their island system, as well as connecting Tunis into the Aragonese possession in Italy. And again, Malta is also now just brought into the Italian hold. Furthermore, Corsica, as part on top of being also connected to the Western Mediterranean islands, gives another avenue attack into Italy through Pisa. Naples itself is connected through Corfu, giving the Ottomans options to go into Italy early and vice versa, if the Italians do so wish. Furthermore, a lot of the islands inside of the Aegean Sea and this entire area have now been connected, mainly through Naxos, so the knights are at least a bit less protected through the straight crossing, as is Crete. Furthermore, you're now able to walk between um, the Ottomans' Sugla province into the Genoese uh, territory here, into Naxos, and across into Athens, giving the Ottomans another movement option to the south of their country. Another interesting addition has been a second optional front for the Mamluks and Ottoman early fighting, namely that Cyprus is connected past the uh, Halab fort for the, well, for the Mamluks, and is connected to this province here, which while highlands is not a fort. The Ottomans are able to walk through this area, or the Mamluks, if enough military access is gained, and any of them have naval superiority, allowing them to have multiple fronts and abilities to bypass each other's forts, hopefully adding a bit more of an interesting dynamic to this only one. Now, before we get to the defines and the things that have been changed in terms of cannons not taking damage in the background and the like, let's quickly go over some map changes. England is no longer obligated to immediately give up their cause or lose them to the French in the Hundred Years' War, although the pressure is still there and they're probably still best off if they want good diplomacy to do that. Maine is now held by Provence, which means that that event no longer happens. This gives England the ability to attempt to contest this land a bit more against the French, because they won't be declaring an offensive war against them in five seconds upon the game I'm pausing. This also helps address the fact that France has a much stronger initial position over the English, and hence will hopefully help balance the setup. The main balancing act, however, is going to be Burgundy. See, Burgundy is going to be a player as well as France, but they have a much harder time of well contesting France due to their smaller economy and army. As such, in a rather interesting twist of, fat, of uh, fate, they've been given Provence as a starting vassal, who now also owns Maine. This is a double-edged sword, as if France can declare war on Maine on Anjou to get relatively easy war goals to grab early on. However, while they do that, this is going to distract the French army, giving the Burgundians time to move in in the early term. In the early term. So even if the Anjou is not the war goal, it's still going to be a distraction at the minimum. And if the um, Burgundians are able to push through this area and link up with it, they have some interesting counterplay options as well. Furthermore, Lorraine does continue to be a personal union under Provence, meaning that Burgundy actually has a relatively significant amount of the land starting in this area. So we'll see how that dynamic plays off in the uh, play war between France and Burgundy, unless they decide to cooperate for whatever reason. Moving on to Italy, we see that Venice starts inside the Holy Roman Empire, as does the other Italians, namely in this case, well, Naples. This will give them a more equal footing and ability to contest the land in Italy a bit easier without having to worry about the Emperor ship's involvement. Bologna does of course remain outside of the Empire, but that's because I'm not ceding anyone there. On that note, of course, Naples does start independent, as does the Swedish, but not the Norwegians since they're not a seed, meaning that Sweden still has a relatively non-trivial amount of early game fighting against the Norwegians and Danish, but they do immediately start the game independent. So now let's talk over the defiance changes and the base game mechanic changes. First things first, the ticking war sweeping gain has been increased to 40 to get to make the war goals more important, and the rate of ticking has been substantially increased as well. Furthermore, the war reparations have been decreased to 5 war score cost instead of 10, but instead of providing you with 10% of the country's income, they now provide you with 5. Additionally, you are able to take a lot more money in peace deals individually, allowing people to fight each other for, well, money and not for land. You are able to now ask for 10 loans, or 50 war score worth of money, in one battle. Well, one war to be clear. However, at the cost of taking 10 loans from your opponent worth of money, you are also going to be having to get 50 war score. So we'll see how that pans out. The relatively standard MP stuff has also been changed. The state uh, prosperity modifier has been uh, changed to not include any more development cost, as has the dev cost edict been reduced, now being called the uh, Monthly Devastation Encouraged Development uh, Edict, basically, giving you access to both a decrease in monthly devastation and some local prosperity, monthly prosperity tick. This is basically the edict you use to gain the new 
prosperity, which gives you some construction costs, some construction time, production and goods produced, so a bit better in terms of the economy, as well as a bit more local tax and center of trade upgrade costs, which we'll get to in a minute. Devastation has also been made significantly worse, as well as increasing local development cost by 50% instead of, well, 100, uh, instead of the 10 previously. It now completely removes uh, tax, manpower, sailors, goods produced from the area at 100%, nukes both your friendly and hostile movement speed, decreases your supply limit in the province by 75% at 100%, and more, incru more crucially, increases the maximum attrition for both you and the enemies by up to plus 10. This doesn't increase the attrition flat, of course, however, it increases the maximum effect possible of attrition by a whole 10 points, meaning that it becomes much more devastating and, well, costly to fight on devastated land itself. I'll see how this change pans out in the future, but devastation is one of those things you probably don't want to be stacking for maximum attrition, since it does hurt your ability to be, well, prospering and actually use the, well, province. Furthermore, Lemon Mod has changed the Expand Infrastructure button to now not give you any dev costs any of the other buttons that you were forced to press as a micro, and now it just costs 50 admin to gain a building and a manufacturing without any governing capacity cost. Speaking of governing capacity cost, I've tabbed into Florence and annexed Sways of France to get ourselves over GovCap, and you're about to see that that is something you probably don't want to be doing too much in this mod, however at least it doesn't hinder your expansion. See, for being 100% over GovCap, your production efficiency is going to be reduced by 50%, as is your national tax and your stability, as well as your national tax. Your stability cost literally doubles and your advisors become twice as, three times as expensive. Your improvement relations also suffers and your AE impact, uh, well, stays the same to vanilla. However, your dev cost modify increases by up to plus 50% for being over 100% over gov capacity. So while you can go over gov cap to conquer, you're not going to be going over gov cap and then devving as well, unless you really want to be paying the one of points for that. Not too many national ideas have been changed in this mod, Tunis and Morocco, however, have had an idea rebalance to make their initial matchup against Castile a bit more palatable as well. Tunis now opens with a rather impressive 20 cavalry combat ability and plus 5 block damage, which gets uh, well comboed with their access to 5% discipline in their ideas, which they didn't have previously. The rest of their idea set actually remains relatively unchanged, with a couple of other modifiers removed. However, their ideas are significantly more viable now, and they're not an automatic get rid of if you ever do decide to form Andalusia which has also gained 5 discipline at the cost of 10 goods produced, as well as some other changes which I'll leave uh, for you to discover. Morocco now also gains 10 morale navies and 25 naval force limit to allow them to navally contest the uh, Castilian Strait crossing a bit better. However, they don't gain military buffs for a while, until they need to wait until the second idea, until they gain the slave soldiers for 20 cavalry combat ability. And they still get the 5% discipline they, norm they well deserve as a playable country basically, However, that requires them actually finishing their ideas. Now, Lemon Mod has made a now Lemon Mod has made a significant rework of the normal idea sets. So, before we get into those, a quick disclaimer: cavalry has been changed now, where you can do cavalry builds. However, because of the changes to cavalry, and with that in mind, and with the cavalry to infantry ratio becoming an actual resource. I was not happy with the Sunnis having 10% cavalry comp cavalry to infantry ratio practically for free. This is the only cavalry infantry ratio I've actually removed in this mod, but I have changed it to a rather substantial buff as well for the Muslims, allowing the Moroccan and Tunis player to also contest Castile a bit better, and also allowing the Ottomans to be able to not easily win one ones against Hungary, which is something I've been seeing it recently lose, which is unusual, but you know, uh, a buff to the Ottomans is a uh, not a very popular decision usually, but. I feel like it gives them a little bit of an edge early. And that edge, of course, is the fact that the Sunni starting religion buff is plus 10 cavalry combat ability, which allows it to better compete against the Catholics with their mechanics of early crusade morale and other early crusade military buffs. The Zoroastrian religion has also been buffed in case anyone ever wants to actually go for it, but it's not been buffed too much, namely just minus 10 land fire damage received. So it's more of a worthwhile thing to pick up if you can be bothered to go for it. Stability has also been mildly tweaked to now providing 30% global trade power instead of plus 3 for being extra instability. I found 1% global trade power per point of stability being honestly kind of insulting, so there we go. Furthermore, prestige is now much more impactful. I saw that in multiplayer especially prestige just kind of became irrelevant. So by making it 20 morale of armies and 20 morale of navies at 100 prestige, we should see a bit more people actually caring about getting prestige before they go to battles. Furthermore, 20% AE impact instead of minus 10 should also help with the early expansionism, but not too much anyway. It should also make players value 
prestige increases a touch bit more. This has been a, this is also a great time to mention innovativeness, which has been also reworked. At 100% innovativeness, your yearly army and navy tradition remains. However, you now gain minus 10 tech and idea cost instead of the all power cost. However, to make up for that relative nerf, you're still gaining 50% extra institution spread, 50% reform progress growth, and your estates gain 10 extra loyalty equilibrium just for the innovativeness mechanic. This is not as good as the 10 all power cost, but I felt like I wanted to reduce the amount of all power costs available in this game to make it more of a special modifier, not just something gained for innovativeness. Bankruptcy has also been made substantially more damaging. On top of the usual issues of going bankrupt, like losing stability and all your monarch points, your morale of armies and navies is now decreased by 75% not 50, as well as some other fun modifiers on the side, like taking an extra 25 fire and shock damage uh, on top of everything, and you lose the ability to declare war in case you are ever planning on doing that anyway. This, uh, the cannot declare war of course, uh, helps against people just uh, chronically trolling while bankrupt, in terms of just declaring hopeless wars they can't win, and well, messing up in that regard. But otherwise, yeah, bankruptcy is made a bit more substantial, but it still only lasts 5 years, so we'll need to see how that works out. Furthermore, being ahead of time in Mill now also reduces corruption, just like being ahead of time in Dip and Administration, as well as also providing minus 2 national unrest for being ahead of time in Mill Tech. This shouldn't, be, this shouldn't make being ahead of time in Mill Tech better than normal, but should also provide a, well, a reason to go ahead of time in Mill Tech a bit more than you normally would, instead of just waiting to take it, take it until someone else does. But we'll see if that works out. It's not a substantial buff anyway. Rome maintains the religious centre local province. However, the occupation of Rome and subsequent occupation of Rome as not Catholic have been removed. This allows Catholics such as Florence to, well, contest the, pape, the Pope without hurting themselves too much in the process. But with that done, let's now move on to the centres of trade, which have also been changed. Namely, the last couple of levels of centres of trade have been changed. As before, you need 25 well, development to gain access to the level 3 center of trade on both land and water. But for the low, low price of just 2,500 ducats, you're going to be able to upgrade it to level 4. So here we are, and we're upgraded to the Imperial Dry Docks. The Imperial Dry Docks are a bit more substantial, and they're still not the final level. The Imperial Shipwright is the level 5 center of trade. There it is on the map for you as a level 4 center of trade. It provides significantly more trade buffs in the area, as well as some new things. For 2.5k ducats, you're getting 2.5 global goods produced, as well as a more substantial yearly native tradition decay, more local development costs in the area, although bear in mind you still have to dev to 35 to gain access to it, as well as some local prosperity growth and possible number of buildings in the, in the provinces in the area itself. Once a development of 50 has been reached and you have saved 10,000 ducats, you're able to upgrade it to the Imperial Shipwright. This will use your max level center of trade merchant mechanic, so you can't get too many of these, but these are incredibly powerful getting an obscene 100 local trade power, more goods produced, trade value modifier for the province as well as institution spread on the area, you're gaining local construction, time, cost and bunch more sailors, with 30% local development cost for the own provinces in the area, as well as a more substantial buff to its local prosperity growth. Globally, you're getting 5 morale of navies, 5 goods produced and minus 1 yearly navy tradition decay for your trouble. At the point where you're able to afford these, I'm assuming you're able to maintain a 100 yearly navy tradition, since you'll have some other things going for you at this point, like protecting trades with light ships. But that is something for me to see, and it gives a late game money sink. An inland version of this is also available. The World Trade Center can now be upgraded. Once 35 development has been reached and another 2,500 ducats have been acquired, you can upgrade it to the Imperial Center. This is more of like a military-esque version of the uh, naval dockyards, now giving you minus 0.2 yearly army tradition decay, as well as some local defensiveness in the area and the usual local development cost minus 20. Furthermore, the manpower from the area has been increased and the local regiment cost has been reduced by 25%. This is only for hiring troops in this province. Once troops have been hired in this area, they don't become cheaper later on. But if you are building troops and have one of these, it is 25% cheaper to build your army in this province instead of anywhere else. Once 50 development has been hit and you've saved up 10,000 ducats again, you're able to upgrade your imperial centers into your imperial headquarters. These are a lot more substantial, given 100 local trade power, an extra fort level in the province, local regiment costs of 50% now, as well as some more substantial institution spread. The local assault force, the local assault fort cost modifier, also means that it costs 105 mil to assault this place instead of just 5 mil, so people shouldn't be assaulting it that much. The owned provinces in the area now also, well, get minus 30 local dev cost. The manpower from the area is substantially increased by plus 75, as well as getting some more defensiveness and your normal plus one possible number of buildings. 
Finally, getting a level 5 version of this will give you a 2.5 buff to your morale of your armies, as well as a more substantial 0.5 yearly army tradition decay decrease. Once you get like 4 of these with all 4 merchants and spend 40,000 ducats, you'll be able to get an extra 10% morale and minus 2 yearly army tradition decay, which is a lot more substantial. On that note, I've made professionalism much more impactful. It's not just a bar that you stack for manpower now, although you can certainly do that. At 100% professionalism, you also gain 10 discipline as a scaler. So professionalism is something you want to build up and maintain, and only stack at the literal discipline cost of your armies for manpower. But right before we do get into the idea work, a quick uh, pit stop mention in two extra decisions that have been added. Inside the idea work, there are no access to well colonists. So the only way to colonize is through the colonizable decision. This requires Diplomacy Tech 8, or if you are Portugal, you're able to take the Portuguese colonial growth, which also gives an extra colonist as well as global settler increase. This does, however, mean that as Portugal, you need to go and get your 800 spent as soon as possible to get this going faster for you. But once Diptech 8 has been acquired, every single player can get the decision colonize the world until the end of the game, giving you plus 2 colonists and 200 colonial range, as well as 10 prestige for the fun of it. This modifier lasts until the end of the game, and furthermore, the AI will never take this decision meaning that you don't have to worry about AI randomly colonizing. Furthermore, I mentioned cavalry to Thracia being a resource, and this comes into the decision of the introducing elite cavalry. When you have 50 prestige, you can get the elite cavalry armies until the end of the game. This will increase the cost of your cavalry, but it makes them significantly better, giving you 10% cavalry combat ability as well as uh, 50 cavalry flanking ability. The cost, however, comes at the cost of the cavalry to Thracia, which you lose 25% of since you've introduced elite cavalry regiments. This way, if you have a lot of cavalry to infantry ratio, and you have extras basically, you can trade it down for cavalry combat ability. But with all that said and finally done, let's get into the actual ideas. But there we go, all of this has been fully done, policies created, and all fully localized. So let's go over them now, and I'll start to show you what I mean by having alternatives with your idea builds. There are multiple different builds you're able to pursue here. Of course, I'll need to see an actual game to see which ones are the best, and which ones are worse, and which ones need nerfs or buffs. But again, uh, the, the idea here is that multiple different countries can have multiple different idea builds instead of multiplayer just going straight into uh, quality economic every single game. So, uh, and if, actually another thing that is important to mention, ideas in this mod are at 40% ratio, so you have to go 1-1-1 one, one, one on your opener before you're able to do other things. But let's begin with probably the thing that people care about the most, military. Opening infantry ideas uh, increases your infantry combat ability by an impressive 15%, but of course focusing on your infantry hurts your cavalry and artillery by a further 5% as well. The same can be seen for the other three idea groups already, with the cavalry focus and the artillery focus there, but we'll get to the policy between all three of these military groups, and yes, there are two policies that require three idea groups that we'll get to later, that allow you to counteract that. But in essence, the, this is also the only idea with negatives attached to it. Your infantry focuses, cavalry focuses, and artillery focuses on your opener. But again, getting back to infantry it is 15 infantry command ability off the opener, minus 10 infantry cost, shock damage received minus 10 and fire damage received minus 10, since infantry is a lot more about holding the line than actually hurting the enemy, such as cavalry or artillery. You get some melee army professionalism ticking, some general cost reduction, and 5% discipline for finishing infantry. The actual finisher is land leader maneuver and max general maneuver plus one meaning that your generals now go have between 1 and 7 maneuver pips instead of 0 and 6. Now we get to cavalry ideas, where you again gain 15 cavalry combat ability at the cost of infantry and artillery combat ability as well. Your cavalry becomes 15% cheaper since cavalry tends to be a lot more expensive. However, you then get your Yeti army traditions and Yeti prestige from your horse soldier traditions. You deal an extra 15 shock damage with your cavalry in the next idea slot. You gain 50 cavalry uh, flanking ability and cavalry to infantry ratio plus 25% from this policy, as well as dealing 10 more morale damage from your cavalry ideas, finishing off with 5 discipline and a max leader shock and a land leader shock of plus 1. Artillery ideas are probably not something you're opening with since it significantly hurts your ability to fight in the early game, but they're probably something you want to be taking second or you're taking it as agreed Spain. Anyway, 15 artillery combat ability here is then followed by minus 10 artillery cost. Followed by 33% siege ability and artillery level available versus forts plus 2, allowing you to really siege down all the forts that are going to be about to be buffed by fortification ideas. You also gain 15 land fire damage as well as artillery barrage cost minus 50 and artillery assault, fort assault cost minus 100, allowing you to barrage at half the price for 25 mil instead of uh, 25 mil instead of 50 and assault for literally free. Finally, artillery idea comes with a global attacker dice draw bonus of plus 1. This is entirely useless when you're defending your country but is quite good when you're attacking, and you do finish with 5 discipline. The finisher, of course, is a land leader fire and max general fire of plus 1. 
Fortification ideas follow suit by trying to basically counteract the radius, providing minus 50 fort maintenance and global monthly devastation for, well, allowing you to spam force everywhere to counter devastation and counter the artillery ass or assaults. You gain some monthly war, co war exhaustion, cost reducing war exhaustion in your uh, decision to build resolve. You gain some fort defense here in extensive fortification, as well as 33% garrison size and 20 garrison army damage to counter all the assaulting from artillery ideas. Finally, you pick up a global defensive dice roll bonus of plus one, so that you can roach on your forts a lot better. And as, as defensive previously, you gain 15 morale of armies at the finisher, as well as uh, attrition for enemies plus two and max loss uh, attrition plus two for again roaching in your defensive lines. Finally, we get to logistics, which is kind of quantity, but better basically in terms of its idea group. Uh, we start with land maintenance modifier minus 10 and 20% movement speed from preparing emerging infrastructure. You then get 20% more natural manpower modifier, followed by minus one yearly armatrician decay and plus two liters without upkeep. You then gain a 25% of both force limit modifier and natural supply limit modifier in the next idea, followed by 10 natural garrison growth as well as the ability to refill garrisons, independently of your professionalism. Furthermore, you also will be able to constantly regain manpower spending when disbanding, regardless of your professionalism, as well as gaining 20 manpower recovery speed. Finally, finishing off with an extra 15 morale of armies, much like fortification, and losing 33% land attrition. Now, all of these have policies. I'm not going to go through the policies because we will be here forever. But a lot of the policies have been made with nerfing weaker idea sets in mind, and so on and so on, to provide different interesting builds. Logistics, Intrigue, and Administrative also have a triple policy between them that requires all three. As well as Infantry, Cavalry, and Artillery also have a triple policy between them, which also does require all three. Now, the only reason I mention this, of course, is because the localization is broken, and it's actually a paradox fault, not my own, where it just says you need two of them, any two of them, to get the idea. You don't, you need all three. Moving swiftly on to diplomatic ideas, uh, in the Lemon Lobby, I'm going to be adding a rule where to have marches, which I've significantly buffed as well, you're going to need to have vast ideas completed. Otherwise, you're not allowed to have marches. I haven't coded that yet, and I don't know if I will get around to it, but that's kind of the thinking there. Anyway, vast ideas opens with plus two dip reputations and plus 25 improved relations, followed by liberty desire minus 10% uh, and liberty desire from subject development minus 50, allowing you to have, well, bigger vassals. Then you get some more vassalization acceptance and annexation relation impact, uh, followed by income from vassals and vassal force and contribution. You get plus three dip relations in your infiltrating your vassal administration, as well as the ability to fabricate claims for your subjects. Then you get a yearly prestige and monthly spender as more of a filler thing, before you finally unlock the transfer subject to peace treaty at half cost for basically the rest of the game, as well as the ability to create client states. The finisher includes the dip annexation cost. Now we move on to colonial ideas, which instead of buffing your colonization, although it does do that, also increases how much value you can get out of your colonies and how good they are. You have no maintenance on exploring leaders, so that is a general that is a conquistador that is exploring. If he stops exploring, he, you just have to start paying maintenance on him again. That is your one mil a month and so on. And furthermore, it allows you to recruit those explorers and conquistadors in question, which again, you don't actually get from the colonize the world decision. You are reliant on the knowledge of the colonization spreading to you if you don't go colonial. Then you get another 100 colonial range here just to really help you get places a bit further, followed by 10 global settler chance and 50 global settler increase. Then you get some more global tariffs, which is not great since global tariffs isn't a good way of making money, but treasure fleet income is, so there's another 30% of that. You get a bit of a filler with the colony change type cost modifier, 100% allowing you to change the type of your colony for, well, free, and you also reduce the liberty desire on other contents of, well, your colonies by 25%. Then the relatively good stuff. The colony development boost of plus two means that you gain six free development on every colony you colonize. Furthermore, your colonies are 50% cheaper to colonize, allowing you to run a lot more colonies even without, well, a colonist. Finally, you gain 25% global trade power, and on the finisher, your natives stop uprising. Now, moving on to maritime ideas. This is kind of the naval but inside of maritime, th um, but inside of a bit policy. And furthermore, this idea group is much more focused on using the Navy to buff your military capabilities instead of being a direct replacement for military capabilities. Maritime Ideas opens with minus 25 ship cost, followed by minus 25 ship building time and 50 global ship repair, allowing your ships to be getting into battles a lot faster, but not actually improving their individual quality. You then gain 20% more national sailors, followed by 25% cheaper admirals. Finally, you start getting 20 marine force limit, allowing you to use those minus 10 shock damage marines a bit more substantially as well as losing the combat penalty when landing of minus one, meaning that, you know, you, you can land people at minus two now instead of, uh, at minus one now instead of minus two. 
You also don't get attrition when you are loaded on ships, and you disembark from them 50% faster by improving your transports. And finally, you get some naval pride because of the greatness of your navy. Your morale of navies is increased by 10, but also your morale of armies is also up by 5. Not really worth taking the entire idea set for just 5 morale, but it is there as a little side effect for anyone taking maritime. The finisher also decreases your navy tradition decay by a whole minus 2. Now we get into manufacturing ideas, which is kind of the trade and goods produced inside of an idea set. Manufacturing ideas opens with trade company investment costs of minus 50% and a substantial 33% decrease in the center of trade upgrade cost. Stacking that with prosperity, you're now looking at minus 48% center of trade upgrade cost, which is a lot of money that you're saving if you're looking at those level 5 centers of trade. We then follow up with the naval force increases and trade steering buffs from building trade fleets, some merchant trade power and cost promote mercantilism from investing in trade protectionism, 15 production efficiency since this is manufacturing ideas, followed by a minus 10 decrease in the minimum autonomy in territories to help you get more value out of your trade companies, 10 flat goods produced everywhere, and 20 trade efficiency, since this is basically the trade efficiency idea set and there's not much else trade efficiency, well, in these ideas. The finisher gives you a flat 0.2 goods produced or one free production development on every single one of your provinces, which is not as egregious as the plus two goods produced in cost of nations, but is certainly a non-trivial economic buff. Then we move on to intrigue ideas, which is basically diplomatic and espionage morphed into one and tried to be useful. You open with two diplomats and envoy travel time because of your espionage core. You gain the ability to claim entire states, gain, you can also claim bordering claims uh, forever, and your cost of fabricate claims are also reduced by 50%. Furthermore, you're able to crush any internal spies and dissidents, decreasing foreign spy, increasing your foreign spy detection to be cleared by 25%, and making all your estates incredibly more loyal, since you've well crushed all the dissidents. You then pick up always valid excuses, because our actions are sometimes not powerful to our neighbours, and if you have an excuse ready, it's fine. If someone catches you spine, you don't get a diplomatic impact hit from that, so it's more of a placeholder, but you also get lowered impact on stability from diplomatic actions. Furthermore here, you get minus 25% aggressive expansion impact, and minus 20 points of war score cost in your ability to negotiate for natural borders. You then get one more filler in your change rival cost being reduced to basically free and gaining mild power projection from insults before finally getting minus five all power costs for your constant scheming. This of course is also concluded with a possible and free policy that you pick up from getting intrigue ideas completed. So it's more of a relatively useless placeholder until the final two, which also have good policies. But now let's move on to the admin, where we start with scientific ideas. You open with minus one prestige decay and 0.5 flat yearly infamous to allow you to get it up earlier as well as 50% innovators gain in the next, well, idea. You then get minus two unrest from public schools and it's a bit more of a filler before picking up your expanding your ruler, well, education. In democracies, well, sorry to be clear, republics, you gain a random candidate skill bonus of plus one, but for monarchies, they get a monarch military skill of plus one as well. This is further exemplified by your institution embracement cost being reduced by 33% and you gaining plus two monthly spender. Then you get minus 10% tech cost for your cult of rationalism, Cult of ration Rationalism. Then your Cult of Rationalism gives you minus 10 tech cost, followed by a monthly mill power point from finishing scientific ideas that you pick up from this idea set. Don't worry, an admin and dip point is available in other admin ideas as well. The finisher also provides you with minus 10 idea cost, meaning this is a great pickup early from the innovativeness gain that you pick up from it, and basically being the innovative ideas of old, but reworked and made significantly better for them to compete with every other idea so far shown. Then we move on to development ideas, one of the few sources of dev costs in this mod. You open with 10% construction cost, followed by minus 25 construction time, followed by great projects being 25% cheaper to upgrade. These are mostly filler. Then you get a global possible number of buildings plus one. This is free and it does seem good, but bear in mind in lemon mod, you're able to increase, get an extra building slot anywhere you specifically want for 50 admin. So in essence, this is just kind of saving you 50 admin or a click on this expand infrastructure. Since this button is literally free to press, it doesn't increase your gov cap cost at all. Getting back to the ideas, you finally get your 10% dev cost, five ideas into development, which is then followed by another dev cost and primary culture decrease of minus 10, allowing your development ideas to compete with the other ideas I've shown so far, but meaning that you need to culture convert into primary culture or focus on those provinces to get the full minus 20. For now, you're only getting minus 10. The finisher is a possible number of manufacturers completing the duo here for a free plus one expansion. And the ultimate finisher on development is an autonomy change cooldown reduction of 25%, only to decrease autonomy faster. Now, GovCap is another substantial issue towards your, uh, well, administration of your realm, and this is where administrative ideas come in. 
you open with 200 governing capacity, followed by monthly autonomy change to, well, administer your land better. You gain some reform progress growth and monthly reform progress if flat to help you press the button for monthly reform progress growth being converted into your, well, governing capacity. You then get some states governing cost as well, which should significantly decrease the amount of governing capacity you're actually using. You then gain a bit of stability cost modifier minus 20 and another 10 or state stability equilibrium, not as good as the spine ones, but you know, it's there. Followed by plus two max promoted cultures and 25 religious unity, which should help that if you're struggling with govcap, you're probably struggling with religious turmoil and humanism. If you notice, there is no humanist or religious ideas, so this is pretty much the closest to managing that. Furthermore, finishing administrative will give you access to a monthly admin point as well, as, 20, as well as 25% governing capacity. Then we get to court ideas, court advisor ideas to be clear, and this is more of the advisor idea set. You open with 20 average monarch lifespan, which is mostly great for republics, but still isn't bad for your monarchies. Followed by three possible advisors, as well as human advisor chance. The reason for this is more of a LARP reason. You know, you've realised that you can hire not just the men, but the women too. Which will literally double your candidate pool for your advisors. Now you get onto the actual things you probably want here. Your admin advisor cost is reduced by 15%, as well as gaining plus 50 flat govcap. So it's getting your greater administrative advice. You get better military advice, also decreasing your general cost by 15, and you get 15% cheaper mill advisors. And no surprise guessing there, you get a monthly dip point here, for expanding your diplomatic advice as well as minus 15 diplomatic advisor cost, giving you 15% flat across the board for taking all three. You then pick up an impressive 0.5, not 0.3 year Republican tradition, as well as plus one devotion, legitimacy, or horde unity for anyone else taking advisor ideas, followed by a non trivial all estate influence modifier of minus 10, and allowing you to revoke estate privileges regardless of loyalty and influence. The finisher is another minus 25 advisor cost, meaning taking advisor ideas decreases your advisor cost by 40% on its own, regardless of other national bonuses that you want to pick up. Finally, we get to financial ideas, which is kind of manufacturing ideas, but early game. It provides early game boosts to your economy, but it kind of tails off in the late game. It opens with minus 2 unrest and plus 0.5 global prosperity goes from you supporting local communities. Then you get some interest per annum reduction, and there's another policy with uh, finance and fortification for another 0.5, uh, interest per annum reduction, allowing you to get minus one from your build, as it were. You're then able to pick up a monthly gold depletion chance modifier of 100% by securing sustainable mining practices, as well as your monthly gold inflation being decreased by 25%. So if you are going to be relying on gold mines, financial ideas might be an idea to pick up. You also get some yearly inflation reduction decreases, as well as your reduced inflation cost as well, which is useful for any country. 10% construction cost is also available in this idea set to, well, help you get your early temples and so on going for scaling your economy. You pick up minus 0.05 monthly war exhaustion impact, and furthermore, the impact of your overextension is halved, allowing you to mitigate, well, the impacts of your constant wars. Finally, you pick up 5% of trade efficiency and a very impressive 50 domestic trade power, which is pretty useless outside of your domestic territory, but it helps you control your domestic trade. The finisher includes 20% national tax to get you get that to help you get the money going early. The policies can be explored inside of the mod download available in the link below, but again, I'm not going to go over them here. The video is probably long enough as it is. But for the most part, that concludes Lemon Mod. There's probably a couple other things I've tweaked, uh, a lot of main things I've gone over and made it more balanced, at least in my understanding. So we'll see how Arak absolutely destroys the Stobby on Sunday. But that has been it. So this has been the project that I've been working on for the, first, the past couple of weeks. We'll be back to modify stacking sooner rather than later. So as with that all said, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.